Hello and welcome to Daily Prayer with For and From St Catherine's. We're looking this week at the Ten Commandments, the latter half of the Ten Commandments, and we're on to number eight, uh, which is pretty pretty brief. It is, you must not steal. Uh, we looked yesterday at how Jesus unpacked you must not murder and you must not commit adultery to covering not just those specific crimes, but everything that comes underneath them. You, you must... You must treat everybody with respect at all times and anything short of that is murder and or adultery. Well, so what about you shall not steal? It's an interesting one, actually. We will uh, we will look at it and we will look at some detailed laws that come shortly after the Ten Commandments, which cover matters of theft and how the ancients dealt with them. I hope you'll find it interesting. Join me for that and join me for our opening prayer. And on to our reading, which comes from the book of Exodus. In Exodus chapter 20, amongst the Ten Commandments, it simply says, you shall not steal. That's fairly straightforward. Just two chapters later, however, Moses clearly felt that some extra detail was needed on this one. Uh, no extra detail on murder, no extra detail on adultery. But when it comes to stealing, well, there's plenty of it. This is what Moses had to say on the matter. When someone steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters it or sells it, the thief shall pay five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. The thief shall make restitution, but if unable to do so, he shall be sold for the theft. When the animal, whether ox or donkey or sheep, is found alive in the thief's possession, the thief shall pay double. If a thief is found breaking in and beaten to death, no blood guilt is incurred. But if it happens after sunrise, blood guilt is incurred. When someone causes a field or vineyards to be grazed over and lets livestock loose to graze in someone else's field, restitution shall be made from the best of the owner's field or vineyard. When fire breaks out and catches in thorns so that the stacked grain or the standing grain of the field is consumed, the one who started the fire shall make restitution. When someone delivers to a neighbour money or goods uh, for safekeeping and they are stolen from the neighbour's house, then the thief, if caught, shall pay double. If the thief is not caught, the owner of the house shall be brought before God to determine whether or not the owner laid hands on the neighbour's goods. In any case of disputed ownership involving ox, donkey, sheep, clothing or any other loss of which one party says, this is mine, the case of both parties shall come before God and the one whom God condemns shall be double shall pay double to the other. When someone delivers another, to another a donkey, ox, sheep or any other animal for safekeeping and it dies or is injured or is carried off without anyone seeing it, an oath before the Lord shall decide between the two of them that the one has not laid on the property, hands on the property of the other. The owner shall accept the oath and no restitution shall be made. But... If it was stolen, restitution shall be made to its owner. If it was mangled by beasts, let it be brought as evidence. Restitution shall not be made for the mangled remains. When someone borrows an animal from another and it is injured or dies, the owner not being present, full restitution shall be made. If the owner was present, there shall be no restitution. If it was hired, only the hiring fee is due. Have you got that? <laughs> it's complicated stuff. What do you make of all of that? What do you make of all those ancient rules? These are three and a half thousand years old, these laws. Did they, did they feel to you to be reasonable? Did they feel to you to be fair? Or did they feel to you to be out of date? of the past. I have to say that 
as I was reading them, I thought, yeah, yeah, I think think that's that's reasonable. That there is a a basic principle underlying all these laws of respect for other people's property, uh, but there is with it an understanding that sometimes things go wrong, and sometimes it's you know it's not. It's not the immediate person's fault that things have gone wrong. Sometimes it is their fault, and you've got to, you've got to look into that. And if it is their fault, then yes, they should repay the person who suffered loss. If it isn't their fault, then they shouldn't. And if it was, if it was willfully causing somebody else loss, then the the expectation is for a higher repayment than if it's accidental. So all of that seemed to me to be very fair. The very next paragraph, the very next paragraph, uh, moves from the subject of property rights to sex. And uh, this is the instruction. When a man seduces a virgin who is not engaged to be married and lies with her, he shall give the bride price and make her his wife. But if her father refuses to give her to him, he shall pay the amount equal to the bride price for the virgin. So basically that meant that if, if a young woman was raped, the man who raped her, or you know, seduced, could be interpreted in different ways. She may or may not have been willing. But if she is raped, if she is coerced into sex with a man, he then can marry her and she has no choice in it and I read that and I think oh, oh dear oh dear the ancients please you know we can we can do better surely than that so what I'm noticing is that when it came to property they had a pretty well balanced well developed set of laws when it came to people they didn't hmm I think that's interesting what that implies to me is that their systems were actually more focused on stuff than on people. That they'd had plenty of time to think through all the ins and outs and ups and downs and rounds and rounds of property theft. But when it came to crimes against people, actually it was pretty brutal and it was pretty blunt. Jesus, 1500 years later said this do not be afraid little flock for your father's good pleasure it's your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom sell your possessions give alms to the poor make purses for yourselves that do not wear out an unfailing treasure in heaven where no thief comes near and no moth destroys for where your treasure is there your heart will be also jesus is taking a very different line from an ancient law which clearly was very interested in property, Jesus is saying, look, it's not the most important thing. It isn't the most important thing. Stuff can just get stolen. If you've got stuff, people will steal it. If you've got stuff, it'll get broken. If you've got stuff, it'll go out. What really matters, what's really of value, of value, is, well, he just talks about treasure in heaven, but we know from Jesus' teaching that treasure in heaven is all about caring for the people who need to be cared for. That's what builds up treasure in heaven. Loving people, caring people, supporting people, valuing the unvalued people. So what do we get from this? Well, what we get from this is the ancients were very bothered about their property. But Jesus says, actually, people... There's more important things than stuff. Focus on the important things. When it comes to property, to stuff, to things, there's a phrase that echoes from my childhood. My mum used to say it a lot. You can't take it with you. 
that sense of in the end stuff doesn't matter when you die you can't take it with you on the other hand St Paul in the passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 13 that we were looking at a week ago he says there are three things that abide three things that last three things that survive faith hope and love and the greatest of these is love that you can take with you that does survive our deaths so when it comes to prayer we always need to be careful that we're not getting obsessed with stuff stuff in the end doesn't matter you can't take it with you what matters is love let's focus our prayers on what matters join me in the prayer that jesus gave us our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. That just about brings us to the end of our daily prayer for today. This evening, England plays Denmark in the European football semi-final. And golly, the news is full of it. The country is obsessed by it. If we win, the country is going to be even fuller of it and more obsessed by it. It's at the top of the news all the way through today. It'll be at the top of the news all the way through tomorrow, whatever happens. Why am I saying this? Because it's incredibly easy for us to get distracted, for us as a, as a whole, as a nation, as a group, as a society, to get distracted onto things that actually don't matter. Sorry to say that, football fans, but actually it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter whether England win or lose. It's not going to make very much difference to anything in the reality of the world. But this tiny thing has obsessed the nation and is obsessing the nation. So it's just a warning to us, not about football, the football's irrelevant. It's a warning to us that societies can get distracted. Societies can get distracted onto things that don't matter and away from things that do. And we have to be cautious of that. We have to be observant of that. We have to resist that. We have to keep our eyes focused on that which actually really does matter. Join me in the prayer, the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all forevermore. Amen.